since this movie came out. 33 since we made it. 33 since we made it, because we shot in 84, and then I had to go out and make some more money to cut it, and um, then it was done, and then it came out. Yeah, and so, you know, I just wanted to ask you, when you think back on that time, or that movie, or us, or, you know, what's the sentence or the word that comes to mind when you have that memory? Pure joy. Pure joy, what about you? I was you? gonna say, magic. Magic. Here's the thing about Desert Hearts. It was this microcosm of incredible people, so talented, so there for this purpose to make this little gem of a film, not knowing if anyone would ever see it because she didn't have a distribution deal, not knowing if it would ever be seen. We were all there with the same purpose, which was love of Donna Deitch, because she was this incredible driving force that made you feel so wonderful to be around. This incredible script that had not been told before in a moment in history in this country um, where it was really important to get out a love story like this, to um, see this beautiful relationship between two women and where it could lead. and let other women out there know that we're here for you. Um, we do, you do have a voice and we'd like to present it to you in a healthy, beautiful way. So the first time I heard of the Desert Hearts was when my agent sent me the script. And you know those experiences where you look across a room and you don't know the person at all, but something happens and you know that you are going to know that person deeply? Uh, well, I got the script and I opened it up and I was still on the first page when it came to the description and said, train pulls into the station, Reno, 1959. And a woman steps off, Vivian Bell. And there was a little character description that talked about her wide cheekbones and her wide mouth. It was an odd, odd experience where I, I said, and I, I knew I was going to do the film. And it was such a, 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 a surprising and visceral experience that I closed the script. And I didn't read it for three days because I, I just, and it wasn't anything to do with the subject matter or anything like that because I hadn't read the script yet. It was just this very odd experience. And as it turns out, it was some harbinger to the watershed that Desert Hearts has become in my life. So. Knowing that, when I did read the whole script and found it to be such a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing and um, such a great character, I was glad that I was going to do it, although I hadn't even met Donna at that point. <laughs> but I just knew that this was my role and that I was doing this movie. I called my agent and said, yeah, I'd like to meet on this. And, you know, there was immediately a sort of, well, are you sure about this, Helen? Because, you know, it's a lesbian love story. and. Uh, I'm like, this is a great script. This is a great character. Yes, I'm sure I want to meet Doc Beth, the director. I came to New York at 19, so I was doing theater. I heard about Desert Hearts actually just a few days before my audition. I hadn't seen the script. I just had a little synopsis of what it was. And then I met Donna. And uh, I didn't really know much about it until I met her. And we had a conversation, and she told me basically what the story was about. and. Then she told me how I would feel, you know, asked me how I would feel about uh, doing a love scene with another woman. And uh, I didn't, it didn't, for lack of a better word, it just didn't really faze me. It was just, the character was so incredible, Kay, that, uh, and it was a love story. And a love story is a love story, and it doesn't matter who it's with. Now listen, when a manager, an agent, 
and my Canadian agent as well, who was in fact a gay man, all said, Helen, listen, this is serious. People are going to think you're gay. And I'm like, so what? I got a lot of pushback from the people around me. But it really never penetrated in terms of changing my knowledge that I was going to do this film and that it was meant to be, you know. It, it really, really, really was as close to love at first sight that proved to be correct as, as, as you can come. I was cast first as Kay, and then Donna flew me to L.A., and I read with three actresses. Uh, something happened with Helen after one of the scenes that we were reading. I grabbed Helen's hands and I kissed them. So right from the start, we just sort of had this chemistry that was very, very comfortable. Donna is a pretty exceptional woman, and she was the first director who was a woman that I ever had worked with. And I was excited by the concept, but didn't know what the difference would be. But it, the difference became apparent immediately. And when I arrived in Reno and went to my room in the Grand Motor Lodge, which was not too grand, but, but really fun, that's where we all lived, um, there was a bouquet and a note. And this note said, Helen, I need all of you. I want you to give me all of you. I need your experience, your intelligence, your passion. I, I need you to help me make this movie. And well, while we have so many talented people here to do this, we have very little money, and very little money means very little time. So let us make an understanding with each other that should there come a moment where there's a, a resentment or a misunderstanding, let us not let, waste time on that. Let us clear it up right away because we need it to be open between us in order to do this work. And, you know, I mean, I've been directed by some great directors by that time in my life, uh, but I'd never been greeted with such an open heart and so uh, such a willingness to say, help me, make this movie with me. Hi. Can I help you, miss? Please. Bring those right out for you. Thank you. For me, what was pivotal about Vivian is that she's a professor of English at Columbia University in 1959. Now, that's exceptional. How many professors of English of, at Columbia University, you know, were women, tenured professors, right? And, and, and then she has this marriage with this man, which, as she says, has died in still waters. So for me, as I explored Vivian, what was important was, how, OK, how does a woman w walk through the hallways of academia at that time? And I decided that she had essentially cut herself off from the neck down, that she kept her body still, that, 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 that her, she lived from here up. Shake hands with Professor Vivian. Hi. Hello. Younger than I expected. Well, I'm not sure that's a compliment. Thank you, Walter. Get the bags, Walter. You're going to love it here. The character of Kay, for me, was... Um, I felt that every time her presence was on the screen, the energy needed to shift. Like, there had to be this sort of wild abandonment of energy that Kay even had trouble controlling or knowing what to do with. What are you doing up in this house? Her life at that point of where she was was still searching, but acting for the rest of the world that she was so together and knew exactly what she was doing and didn't care what anybody thought. And she does. She cares a lot, but was afraid to show that. So she had this armor up, but that's what the character of Vivian really helps her bring out, the vulnerability again of knowing, okay, may maybe I don't have all the answers. You have ambitions. I do all right here. But there's always another story under the surface. You know what I mean? I'm about to. My surface is all but worn away. To be quite honest, Two days before we started shooting, I found out I was pregnant. Uh, and so my first couple of days were almost a blur because I was so tired and I couldn't figure out what was going on with me. Uh, I just felt so tired. And then I found out I was pregnant. So I had to go to Donna <laughs> and say, uh, hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. And I think it probably shocked the shit out of her, but you can ask her that later because it kind of shocked me. Uh, 
I wasn't prepared for that at all. And uh, she was really wonderful about it. She was really wonderful. And we didn't really need to make a lot of adjustments. What I really enjoyed was every morning going out on the set and Janine Oppenwall having the most incredible set. Every little piece, every nuance in the background was so perfect to the period and was so fun to explore. Even my beautiful pottery that's in the house and going through that. In terms of developing the character, I did work with both the makeup artist Donna and the costumer to arc Vivian. I began with a very pale ivory colored base, uh, all cool colors, cool on the lip. Everything was cool, everything was restrained. I worked with my body in terms of her erectness and her withholding, you know, everything that I've been talking about in terms of if you're cut off from the neck down, your body should be still as it moves, your hips don't move. And then the heel and on the shoe and so on, which puts you into that unnatural position. So we arced the whole thing. And as it went on, we brought golds and warm colors into my face and, and makeup. The hair gets looser. There's actually a scene about changing clothes, you know, where I get my cowboy shirt and my jeans and my cowboy boots and go dance and go gambling. <laughs> Some people ask, you know, well, how did you prepare for the relationship? And to tell you the truth, I didn't. I just kind of let it happen naturally. And it even went with my relationship with Helen's character, Vivian, because I really felt it was really important to watch it unfold. I didn't want to have anything sort of preset in my mind, because that to me was an important part of how to um, create this character. Let this unfold, let this let this wave of who is this woman, and she was exotic to me, coming from New York City and being a professor, and just let that kind of wash over and see what would happen. Where are you off to? Lawyer's appointment. No sense in taking two cars. I wouldn't want to intrude. Who bring her back? Uh, don't worry about it, Francis. Hop out, Gwen. Get out of the car for the day and save me a trip. Okay, counting on you to drive like a lady. Somebody used it for an ashtray. What a book. Long time no see, Miss Parker. I'm handling it. Audra Lindley, who was a great actor, great woman, and she she brought it. She was so wonderful. She, she left her vanity at home, let her face be ruddy and bare and naked, and but she insisted on individual eyelashes, which I thought was so fabulous. You know, it is one little remnant of, but but totally appropriate for the character. Thank you, Parker. Then stop fuss and eat your breakfast and leave the woman alone. This doesn't concern you, Francis. Honest. You skate on thin ice, girl. Audra taught me so much. Our relationship, I felt, was such a beautiful relationship. You know, we never really rehearsed our scenes. We just had this innate sense with each other. And she was so generous to me. And not having ever done a film before, she taught me such an invaluable lesson that stayed with me forever. She gave me so much more when it was on my close-up and she was giving her lines off camera to me and how generous she was with her emotion and i just i so appreciated her raw courageous beauty in that film and um she was remarkable she was remarkable to work with well looks like you two got caught we took a drive out to the lake after the party must have been quite a sight to keep you out till now Somebody checking in? No, somebody's checking out. I made a reservation at the Riverside. Your bags are packed. It was very easy to be heartbroken when she misjudged Vivian so deeply. 
Here's your refund check. That was uncalled for. Oh, for God's sake. Don't you talk to me about God, girl. You made your point, Francis. That moment does send Vivian into a huge tailspin because she has been allowing herself to follow her heart, which is newly opened and newly available to her instead of her intellect and her observations of society and so on. And, and, and that kind of judgment taps into Vivian's fear and, and Vivian becomes self-judging and Vivian goes, locks herself in a room and says, leave me alone, stay away, stay away, stay away. Uh, which like any good pressure cooker only makes the soup more juicy, I guess, you know. Are you okay? We didn't shoot the love scene until the last week of filming so that we had time to be really comfortable with each other and even for the, the crew to be comfortable, that we would be comfortable with the crew since we would be in a rather intimate situations. The love scene was difficult for me. Oh, it may also have been because I was pregnant, so I felt very protective of my body. Um, but it was also, you know, it was a long day. It was a long day, and I felt I felt extremely exposed, <laughs> I have to say. But I knew I had to be the aggressor in the scene. You know, I, I Kay's character was the one who was... This was her life, so, you know, I had to bring all of that to the table. And, uh, but after every take, I remember kind of feeling, where's my bathrobe, and kind of putting it on and kind of feeling like this. And so we started again, and then it, you know, okay, here you go. Uh, Donna was extraordinary during that, as was uh, Robert Ellswit and our focus puller, Marty, because uh, it was a very, it was difficult. It was difficult for me, and yet we wanted to get it right. It would, the most important thing was get this right, be as realistic as possible, be as genuine as possible, and be with Helen, which was an easy thing to do because it's really easy to kiss Helen. It's really easy to fall in love with Helen Shaver. <laughs> so take your hands out of your pockets and come here. When Vivian's saying those things, it is because she is feeling so much that it is discombobulating, it's overwhelming, and the rumbling and jumbling and a sort of volcano of all these emotions that are coming up inside of her and sensual feelings and all of those things. For example, there's a moment where they're making love and Vivian comes very close to a climax, to an orgasm, and stops and says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because it's that last surrender to her own self, to her feeling of her own beingness, of her own womanliness, of her own body that she has been out of touch with. And she is feeling something that she has never felt before in that, in that incredible moment of surrender to another human being and to the feeling and, and herself. Donna never broke into the scene. She let us have our full takes. And then she would come back out and we'd talk a little bit more and just let us go. Just let us go and see what would happen. We did talk about it the night before, so we knew the setups. But then, of course, the day of the filming, there was just this really quiet strength from Donna. Obviously, this love scene, sex scene, is at the heart of this movie. Mm -hmm. This movie, without that, is not this movie. In this process, you know, it's it's an evolving chemical mm -hmm. kind of a mysterious um, process, you know. And um, the goddesses were on our side. Hey, you they know, were in it the was room. everything. They were in the everything was brilliant. And on top yeah. of that, these church bells yeah, started that was to ring. Remarkable. Out.
And that was just so serendipitous. Of course, I left them in because, and enhanced them because there they were. Here are these two women, these two characters, you know, they're making love with each other and Christianity in the form of these church bells, church bells you know, came calling. into the room. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I love irony. You know? yeah. And that, um, that I remember the time I just thought, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. I feel like our characters evolved more by us just being with each other, you know, eating with each other, spending time with each other, talking about our lives with each other, so that we felt so comfortable and safe. Donna created a really safe world for us, and everyone felt that. Acting has so many elements to it, and easy is not really the word, but it is like a relationship. My relationship with Vivian, my relationship with the work and, and the making of this film in many ways was very easy. You know, easy like a summer afternoon, you know, easy because you want to be there, easy because you're willing, easy because you're surrounded by, you know, these beautiful artists and like-minded kindred spirits. Jeffrey Tambor, who was in the film, said to me, drink this moment in because you may never have it again. As his far as where he was at his career, he knew that we were involved in something really special. I knew when we were making the film that we were making a beautiful piece of work. And actually in those days, I think I was probably innocent enough to believe that great work was enough. And, and in fact, great work is enough. It was a very overwhelming thing. Telluride was so intoxicating because that was the first time the film had been seen. And they added screenings and fantastic people, like people that I admired and respect, were totally knocked out. It was quite overwhelming. And the success went on. I mean, the Toronto Film Festival was huge. The most exceptional moment was a year or two after the film came out, Glad. Uh, was giving Donna a Woman of the Year award, and it was a fundraiser. And they contacted Patricia and I uh, saying, we would like you to be the secret surprise guests. And Patricia and I walked through the audience and we hit the stage. And the audience, you know, I've had standing ovations before, and standing ovations are a very moving experience. This ovation went on so long that the whole ego got out of the way. The, the overwhelm of the adrenaline rush from it got out of the way. And I stood there looking at this room full of women and I thought, you know, if I never do anything else, I have made a piece of work that represents a group of people where they see themselves, a group of people who've been unrepresented. I absolutely believe that it would have been a very different film had it been directed by a man. I think it needed the sensitivity of Donna. The fact that I'm a director, I really truly believe that seeing a woman do what Donna did to make this film, which is ex an extraordinary feat, made me understand that I could also. And it's led me into a wonderful chapter of my career of directing. I think I was aware that this could be a landmark film. Honestly, I had no idea how important. I had no idea how incredible the reaction would be. I had no idea how it would affect so many people's lives to be a part of something that was at least worth having been a part of and then take it to this whole other level where then people would get in touch with me or I would hear stories or I would you know, be in conversations where it was a life-changing experience for so many women at that time it was just really, really humbling. And how lucky I was to be a part of that, you know? How lucky I was to be a part of that. I love you. It's an affair with a 25-year-old woman, I might add. I really do. I'm sure the students and the faculty will graciously acknowledge that these things happen. There was something very parallel 
between the story itself, mm -hmm. you know, and all of the participants in telling the story. In other words, there was this, this is a love story, mm -hmm. right? And, and, it, was and, and it was as though the set, you know, was filled it with was love. It you know, this was like a love set. Yes. Send me a postcard when you get there. What is it you want? Another 40 minutes with you. <laughs> 